Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you all for coming. I'm Phyllis Eckhouse on the board of the Lower East Side Preservation Initiative, excuse me, also known as LESPI. LESPI is a not-for-profit group formed in 2007 dedicated to preserving the Lower East Side, including the East Village, Lower East Side below Houston, Chinatown, Little Italy, and the Bowery. We're thrilled to celebrate the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage this evening with a book talk with Susan Ware, author of Why They March, Untold Stories of the Women Who Fought for the Right to Vote. Before I introduce Susan Ware, I want to do a little technical housekeeping to make sure things go smoothly. I'm here with Lesby Board President Richard Moses, who joins us tonight. Richard is going to moderate questions, which we encourage you to ask, and which will be answered at the end of Susan's talk. During the talk, you can ask questions through Zoom's Q&A function, which should be at the bottom of your screen. We may not be able to answer all the questions, but we'll try. Also, we want to take a quick poll right now to, to let us know where everybody lives. Don't worry, the answers are anonymous. We'll give the results at the end of the talk. We'll pause about 30 seconds for you to respond. Okay, we'll say another 10 seconds or so. I'm really disappointed I don't get to vote. <laughs> we know where you live, Susan. <laughs> I know, but I would expand your... <laughs> okay, good. All right. Thank you, everybody. Okay, so I want to take a moment to link women's suffrage to a few familiar Lower East Side locations. For example, the Great Hall of Cooper Union on 3rd Avenue south of Astor Place and A Street, which was home to numerous historic suffrage events and rallies, starting as early as 1860, when the National Women's Rights Association held its 10th national convention there. And then suffragist and trade unionist Rose Schneiderman, excuse me, lived uh, at 57-59 2nd Avenue by 3rd Street. Also, suffragist and trade unionist Clara Lemlich lived at 279 East 3rd Street by Avenue C. Also, suffragist and trade unionist Leonora O'Reilly, who grew up on the Lower East Side and worked there also lived and worked briefly at the Henry Street Settlement. Okay, so on to the main event. I'm thrilled to introduce Susan Ware, author of Why They Marched, Untold Stories of the Women Who Fought for the Right to Vote. Susan is the pioneer in the field of women's history and a leading feminist biographer. She is the author and editor of numerous books on 20th century history, including an exploration of Billie Jean King and, and women's sports, and biographies of aviator Amelia Earhart and New Deal reformer Molly Dusan. Educated at Wellesley College and Harvard University, she is taught at New York University and Harvard where she served as editor of the biographical dictionary, Notable American Women, Completing the 20th Century. Since 2012, Susan has served as the general editor of the American National Biography, published by Oxford University Press under the auspices of the American Council of Learned Societies. <laughs> 
Susan has long been associated with the Schlesinger Library at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study, where she serves as the Honorary Women's Suffrage Centennial Historian. The Library of America, just this July, published a women's suffrage anthology that she edited, American Women's Suffrage, Voices from the Long Struggle for the Vote, 1776 to 1965. We're delighted to welcome Susan Weir. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that introduction and um, for reaching out to me and inviting me to be part of this conversation, which seems to be the main way we are all conversing with each other these days his, on history and all kinds of other things. And um, it may not be our first choice, but it's what we have. And let's try to make the most of it, including, I hope, an active question and answer period at the end. Um, I wanted to start uh, by talking a little bit about how I came to write um, my book, Why They Marched. And I think in some ways for me, it was just, it was interesting as I began to retrace my own personal and professional trajectory that got me to this topic. And I realized that um, the women's suffrage movement had really been part of my entire career. Um, I marched in my very first feminist demonstration in Chicago on August 26, 1970, which was the 50th anniversary of uh, the 19th Amendment. Um, not quite sure where those 50 years between then and now have gone, um, but I look back on that moment and think that here I was, you know, a, a Wellesley, uh, Wellesley student, and it was only, women had only been voting for 50 years, and it just seems so strange. And I think now, even now today, people say, <laughs> you mean women couldn't vote 100 years ago? So there was, a, a, I think, a connection there. Um, I'd already become a feminist uh, by 1970, and so... I wrote my senior thesis at Wellesley on the Seneca Falls Convention and the early women's rights movement in the 1850s. Uh, and I <clears throat> enjoyed doing history so much that I decided I would become a historian and I applied to graduate school uh, at Harvard and they accepted me, which I've always thought was kind of strange because there was no place more hostile to women's history in the 1970s than the Harvard History Department. Uh, and yet, um, it gave me a perfect place to ex train to be a historian, explore the wonderful resources of the Schlesinger Library, which I met um, while I was there. Uh, and so, you know, my very first graduate paper um, when I arrived at Harvard was on the local Cambridge Women's Suffrage Organization. And just today, I learned that a blog post I had published for the um, Cambridge Historical so Society about going back and revisiting that paper <laughs> from my perspective today. And so it was sort of then and now. Um, and my second graduate paper was on Charlotte Perkins Gilman, who was one of the characters in my book. Um, my dissertation, which became my first book, was called Beyond Suffrage. I mean, clearly there is a, <clears throat> a trend here. And when I saw the centennial in 2020 kind of lurking on the horizon, I thought, I want to be part of this. Uh, and for me, the best way to do that is by writing a book. Um, <clears throat> now, originally, I had planned to write a biography of Alice Paul. And <laughs> that didn't work out for various reasons, mainly because I just didn't feel that spark of connection that a biographer needs to her subject in order to sustain herself through <clears throat> the long haul of writing a book. So I set that aside. And then I thought, well, the next thing I thought I was going to do was to write a history of the suffrage movement in 
100 objects. You know, there are all those wonderful books, a history of the world and 100 objects, a history of New York City and 50 objects. And I thought, how hard can this be? Well, it turns out it's not so <laughs> easy to <clears throat> make these objects come alive and put them together in a narrative that says something more. Uh, so then it was, okay, <clears throat> back, back to square one again. And I thought, well, you know, I'm really a, a biographer. And so I thought, well, why not a, a, a prosopography? And if that's not a word that you're familiar with, it's it really just, it's a fancy word for collective biography. Um, but it's somewhat daunting. And I had to actually go on Google to listen to how to actually say prosopography. Um, and, I, you know, that really fit my, my bent as a biographer. But finally, fairly late in the process, I realized that I didn't have to choose between objects and biographies and that I could do both. And I think that one of the things that is distinctive about my book and which seems to draw people in is the way that each of the biographies, the short biographies, is paired with an object or an artifact from the suffrage movement. Now, one of the things I'm often asked is, how did I choose my subjects and objects? And a lot of them were ones that I had just known about from hanging out at the Schlesinger Library all my career. Um, but I also knew that I wanted to write a fairly comprehensive history of the women's suffrage movement. So I sort of had a mental checklist of things that and themes that I knew I wanted to include. Uh, obviously, race was at the very, very top of that list. Class, geography, chronology, men, men male suffragists, the anti-suffrage movement. Uh, so I went about my business of choosing people and objects that I knew would then could be woven together into this larger narrative. But above and beyond, the most important criteria for the biographies was that each of the characters had to have a good story. Uh, and the stories were necessary to make the history come alive for readers. And that is where Rose Schneiderman enters the story. Um, I first uh, wrote about Rose Schneiderman in my dissertation, in my first book, where she was part of a network of women in the New Deal. Uh, and so I was already familiar with the later part of her career, but I found myself drawn back to her for her suffrage activism. And I knew that it was absolutely essential to include at least one portrait of a working class suffrage activist. Uh, I think that, not that people know all that much about the history of the women's suffrage movement, but I think there is a tendency to think of it as predominantly white, uh, predominantly middle class. And that is an inaccurate uh, view of the movement. And by adding, including working class activists, uh, broadens our story and enriches it in many ways too. And it's also so important to include um, working class um, suffragists because these were women who had been organizing in their workplaces and through labor unions really for most of their of their working lives and these women were street smart and politically savvy and they brought skills and a kind of spunkiness to the women's suffrage movement as a whole that really helped revitalize it especially in its last decade in the 1910s. So you really can't understand what finally pushes it over the top by 1920 without including the stories of working class activists like Rose Schneiderman and Clara Lemlich and Pauline Newman and there's been Leonora O'Reilly, a whole range of, of women who were central to the story. And I think the third reason for including working class 
um, activists in the suffrage story is that they didn't have the luxury to just think of the vote as a women's issue. They saw it as part of a broad palette of social justice issues, which were going to help empower working class women and empower them both politically in terms of trying to get legislation passed, but also in terms of giving them more, getting them more respect for the labor and the work that they did in the factories and which helped then support themselves and their families. And so they had a quite expansive vision of the vote, um, which I think is one that is in many ways more appealing to activists today because it isn't just about one thing. It sees the vote as part of a whole range of social justice issues that needed and demanded attention in the early 20th century. Uh, and many of those same issues are still needing and demanding attention today, but that's, that's part of another story. Uh, but I think all those reasons are why it was so clear to me that um, this, was, this was an area that I really wanted to document and what fun to go back to Roche Schneiderman. But before I go into the biography with Roche Schneiderman, my book, I had to choose an object and, or an artifact. And, and I was always pretty sure what I would do here. Um, the suffrage movement, at, especially in its last decade, had to, well, think about it, they had to convince men to give them the vote. And many of the men they were trying to convince were recent immigrants who were living on the Lower East Side of New York and in various other parts of the city, um, some of whom spoke English well and some of whom didn't. And since suffrage organizers who were fluent in multiple languages were in kind of short supply, they came up with this tactic of, of printing out very simple one-page flyers in a whole range of foreign languages and then handing them out at street corners, at, um, when factories let out, and it would make the argument, the same argument, sort of point by point in the different languages. You can skip from one to the other and it's almost like you can go from reading German to reading Yiddish to reading French because you can do the translation. And the hope was that either women would take these flyers home to their men folk and get a conversation started, or the men would be interested and take them home. And so it's a way of reaching the voters that they needed. Uh, and again, it shows the importance of um, recent immigrants and working class people in this larger story. So that's the, that is the object that sets up Rose Schneiderman who turns out to have quite an extensive um, suffrage career starting in 1905 when she joins the Women's Trade Union League, which is an absolutely central organization in when you study women's history and you study women's activism, and also a unique organization in that it brings together working class activists and labor union folks, women, with middle and upper class allies um, in one organization in a way that was quite unusual for the time. But <laughs> she was drawn into it, uh, I think by her friend, Leonor O'Reilly. Uh, and it just, it provided her a home, a supportive atmosphere where she could both pursue her labor activism and her feminism. Uh, and so you see her very quickly um, by, you know, a couple of years later, she's out on the suffrage hustings. And that's partly because she joins Harriet Staten Blatch's Equality League for Self-Supporting Women, which was an attempt to bring w women who worked, and not just factory workers, but also professional women, all together in one organization. And of course, Harriet, for those of you who are in the know on your suffrage history, 
Harriet Stanton Blatch is the daughter of Elizabeth Cady Stanton uh, and had spent time in um, England and was probably the most class conscious of any of the American suffragists at that time. So she brings Rose Schneiderman into her organization, welcomes her, gives her a platform, puts her on salary, and off they go. And one of the things I had forgotten about uh, is there's a famous story in 1908 when Inez Mill Holland, who is an undergraduate at Vassar, decides she wants to um, organize a suffrage meeting in Poughkeepsie on campus. And the president, who was a man, said, no way, that's politics, you can't do that here. And she said, well, <laughs> try and stop me. And she held the meeting in the graveyard, um, the local graveyard. And she invited uh, or linked up with a group of touring suffragists who were going from town to town in upstate New York trying to build support for the vote. But what a star-studded speaker's lineup this was. There was Harriet Staten Blatch, there was Inez Mill Holland, there was Charlotte Perkins Gilman was there herself, and there was Rose Schneiderman, who was all of, mm, I guess, 26 or 27 at the time. And I get a sense that she was the one who just got the crowd sparked up and really made the point about why women needed the vote and especially why working women need the vote. And at that point, she's all in with suffrage and will stay with the movement really till the end. She's also, Rose Schneiderman, never gives up on her labor activism. And so I don't think I need to tell this crew about the 1909-1910 uh, uprising of the 20,000, the garment workers strike, uh, but she is very involved in that. And that too draws on the talents and energies both of working girls, working women, and elite supporters, many of whom are suffragists. So once again, she's working in these cross-class alliances, uh, which she sees as a way of building both support for the labor movement and for uh, labor legislation and, organ and um, improvements in the lives of working women through laws. Um, there's a point in 1912 where Rose Schneiderman, who I think of as such a New Yorker, she heads out to Ohio and she's kind of an itinerant suffrage worker out there, but they send her to the cities and she's talking to these gatherings and she seems to have done her magic there just as she did back in New York. Um, and then from then certainly the next big milestone in her suffrage career and in the overall history of the suffrage movement is the 1915 New York State referendum where she is very involved in the industrial section of the New York State Women's Suffrage Party. Unfortunately, uh, the men of New York in 1915 voted down that referendum by a fairly substantial margin. But the suffragists were not daunted. And two years, just two years later, they were able to successfully pass a suffrage referendum in New York State, the first Eastern industrial state to have voted in support of women's suffrage. This was a huge breakthrough um, for the movement. Um, in part because of the numbers of women voting and also the number of politicians in New York State who are in Congress who now are representing women who are voting. And one of the, one of the research points that tickled me the most when I was learning more about Rose Schneiderman's suffrage career in order to write about her for my book was the fact that um, she, she had come, her family had come from Russia in 1890 and lived on the Lower East Side, obviously, and, and she worked. Um, but she had never taken out citizenship papers. And so in either 1916 or in 1917, in 
anticipation of becoming a voter, she becomes a citizen. And so you have this juxtaposition of citizenship and suffrage in one woman's lives that I just thought that was so touching and so appropriate. Uh, and that is how I, how I end her story. Uh, and I think it really, again, makes a larger point about how the suffrage movement is part of a much larger um, debate about citizenship and responsibility in the United States at that time. Um, as I was thinking back about, you know, what, what are my, you know, sort of takeaway points about Rose Schneiderman and her, and her suffrage career, uh, it really seemed to me like there were three of them. Uh, um, and the first of them is a phrase that turns up often in women's labor history, the phrase bread and roses, which is from um, organizing song associated with the Lawrence strike in, 19, in 1912. And it's one that labor activists who were feminists often used. And it was a way of saying, um, we want, you know, the bread is better working conditions and better pay and no sexual harassment on the job and a whole range of and safe conditions so that you don't have things like the triangle shirt waist fire. That's the bread part of it, but that's not enough. And the roses is the friendships and the self-education and just the dignity of these women as, as human beings. And I think that Rose Schneiderman's suffrage ideology always had that broader vision. And it's one that I think it's very compelling today and that we have a lot to learn. It's not just about the nuts and bolts of politics, it's also about what it means to us as people to be politically engaged, to be politically involved. Uh, and that was really what she took away from the suffrage movement. And also, it's also what she brought to the suffrage movement. Um, so I think that's really important. Um, I think a, a second aspect of her suffrage career um, that I don't really talk about specifically in my book um, is her long-term partnership with another labor activist named Maud Swartz. And they were a couple. Uh, and they were one of many such female couples in that period of time, um, didn't necessarily consider themselves lesbians. That wasn't a term that was used. That wasn't how they thought of themselves. And yet they are committed to each other in a partnership that is life affirming and lifelong. And so I think that when we add in Rose Schneiderman's personal choices and her choice to share her life with another woman activist, it helps, it adds another piece of the puzzle of what historians are calling queering the suffrage movement. And by that, what we mean is just sort of opening our eyes to seeing the range of personal choices that suffragists made about how they lived their lives. Many of them were married women and had children, but a lot of them were single women uh, who chose not to marry or who didn't marry. Uh, you had some women who you, we would now call probably gender non-conforming. Um, there are some women who spend part of their lives with men married and part the other parts of their lives with women. Carrie Chapman Cat is a good example of that. And I think one of the things that has been fun for historians is to just start tallying up all of these non-heteronormative <laughs> ways of living as a woman at the time and saying, hey, you know, we have this image of the suffrage movement as being boring and stodgy and all. And, and yet these were interesting, spunky, independent women who were often living their lives on their own terms. And Rose Schneiderman is very much part of that uh, story of recovering uh, these choices within the movement. And I, I think the final takeaway point is one that 
she is just a perfect example of that, how the suffrage participation could really change a woman's life. Uh, and it was through the suffrage movement and through the Women's Trade Union League and some of the other organizations she was involved in that she, in 19, I think as early as 1919, met Eleanor Roosevelt, who was not a suffragist. Um, Franklin, actually, her husband was more of a suffragist than she was back then, but she's a quick learner. And in the 1920s, Eleanor Roosevelt just blossoms as a political activist and a social reformer and the woman who is growing into what I always think of as the conscience of the New Deal. And it is Rose Schneiderman and Maude Swartz who really educate Eleanor Roosevelt about the lives of working class women and what their lives are like why labor unions are important, why labor legislation is important. So she is having, Schneiderman is having a direct impact on Eleanor Roosevelt. And then when Franklin Roosevelt is uh, elected the governor of New York in 1928 and then president in 1932, Schneiderman is part of this network of women social reformers and activists that then, including Frances Perkins, of course, who's a, a great example of this, um, but then start serving in state government in, while, while Roosevelt is governor. And then when the New Deal comes to Washington, move into positions of power in the New Deal. And for Rose Schneiderman, I think the two most satisfying years of her life were when she served on the National Recovery Administration Labor Advisory Board. It was, a it was a position, it was a job. She was part of the New Deal. Uh, and it's very much a fitting trajectory to the way that back in the suffrage period, she's learning to work not just with labor activists, but also with middle-class elite women reformers. And that she feels at home bridging those two worlds, and she's able to basically turn it into a career for herself. Uh, and so, you know, again, it brings me back to, you know, where I started is my, my career as a historian, writing about this network of women in the New Deal, and I chose as the title, Beyond Suffrage. And I think that for many suffragists, there really, it didn't just end on August 26, 1920, um, getting the vote was incredibly important, but it's just one marker in careers that are dedicated to social activism and working for reform uh, for women and for other, uh, other disadvantaged groups. And so I think that Rose Schneiderman, once again, um, that's such an important part for her. And as I mentioned at the outset, for me, it just felt so satisfying to realize that I had started my career writing about Rose Schneiderman and the Women's Network, and I'm not quite finished with my career yet, um, <laughs> but here I have come full circle almost 50 years later, and that I could revisit her career um, and bring her once again to the, the wider audience that I think she deserves. And I know your group thinks that too, because that's why you invited me to come and talk to you. So um, I hope that that sort of short synopsis of my book and also of her career and with your audience and your own um, priorities and interests um, might spark a few questions or, or comments. Thank you so much. That was, that was fascinating. I, I want to start out the questions with the, with, with a few about Rose Schneiderman. I'm, I'm curious to, to try to get a handle on how she was able to communicate so effectively with people so different from herself, namely rich, wasp, <laughs> educated. Was, was it charisma? Was it humor? Was it her, her reputation. And, and I'm also curious 
whether you know what experience she had, for example, touring the country for suffrage with experiencing anti-Semitism. Do we know how she handled it? I, I'd love to know more. Well, I think it's safe to say that she was a very charismatic speaker, um, but it had nothing to do with her physical presence, or maybe all to do with her physical presence. She was only four and a half feet tall. She was tiny. Um, and yet every description of her just makes her sound like a fireball of energy. Um, and there was a way in which, and, and Leonora O'Reilly did this too, and she's sort of on my mind because I'm doing an essay for the New York Times Overlooked series on her. And she had a way also of being able to speak to these all kinds of people and make them realize what her life experiences have been and why it was necessary to change. And that meant being able to speak to fellow women workers, but also to, um, you know, Alva Belmont and, and Anne Morgan and these incredibly rich women. And I think there was a, a just a kind of sense of take no prisoners, uh, <laughs> what have I got to lose that, that people responded to. There was also, I think in her case, real passion about her cause and real anger at some of the things that happened to working women with the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire in 1911 being the best example where she got up at this at the, the meeting afterwards to try and figure out what to do and just said, I'm tired of giving this speech. You know, too many women are dying. Um, we need to change laws. We need to make things different. And so she's really speaking truth to power. Um, as she traveled around the country, and obviously in the suffrage movement, and then in the 20s and, and 30s, she did as well. Um, like many women of her generation, I think she didn't often articulate or write down episodes, let's say, of anti-Semitism. There's a, there's a retinence about reticence about mm -hmm. um, talking about those kinds of details. And, and it certainly applied to her, to her relationship with, with her partner. Uh, this was something that she did not really share with people. And uh, I can't really think of examples. Um, you know, maybe we can channel in Annalise Orlek, who has a wonderful chapter on Rose Schneiderman uh, in her book, Common Sense and a Little Fire, which is a good description of all these women. And she might be able to come up with some examples. But I suspect that in some ways, like the racism that African-American women experienced in the suffrage movement, the anti-Semitism that she likely experienced would not have been new to her and she would have not accepted it, but it would have just been part of the part of what she had to deal with when doing business. Um, so that's a kind of non-answer <laughs> to the thank best you. of my ability. So thank you so much for that. Richard, can you tell us what other questions folks sure, have? Sure. We, we have a nice uh, variety of questions here actually. And um, I We're wish I could ask you about my great grandmother. <laughs> my great grandmother actually worked on the Lower East Side right around this time. She would have been in her late teens working there, and and it would have been nice to have heard her story. You know, if she had experienced uh, the suffragists, uh, yeah, and and that time. But uh, I, I'm a little, it's a little late now to be asking her. But, <laughs> but I did know her uh, until I was in my late teens. Um, uh, we'll just start with uh, how did you choose your objects? That's one of that's one um, question. I think the the answer to that in part goes back to my long association with the Schlesinger Library, and it's the premier women's history library in the country. And many of its sources are not just paper; they are objects and. <laughs> 
you know, going back again to my graduate school days, my first year in graduate school, we had a special tour of the of the vault of the Schlesinger Library, and the staff took our you know our incoming class down there. And one of the things they showed us was the Charlotte Perkins Gilman death mask, which they have in a box, and they open the box and they unfolded it. And when you've seen something like that, you never forget it. And then I was able to use that death mask as the object to set up my chapter on Charlotte Perkins Gilman. So in some ways, I'm remembering things that I've seen all along. Um, and then sometimes I had to go hunting for things. I sort of, you know, some things I knew I wanted, uh, suffrage buttons and, and things like that. Um, but it was again, a, a balancing act. And also it was a chance for me to get some general history in, you know, like the history of buttons in political campaigns. You can't put that in the middle of a biography chapter, but you can do a little standalone thing about, um, about the importance of campaign buttons. And it also is a way of making larger points about how savvy the suffragists were at adapting to new media. I mean, we always think, you know, how did they do it? They didn't have social media, whatever. But they knew how to use the newspapers. They knew how to use newsreels. They knew, knew how to use buttons. So it was a way of finding objects that document that. But the main, main, my main criteria was really having had the privilege of being in the reading room at the Schlesinger Library back when we could, could go into reading rooms and I trust we will be able to do it again soon. And just the special feeling of holding something like a suffrage plaque or a sash or a banner it really makes it come alive. And I think that one of the challenges for historians is finding ways to make this huge movement seem real. And telling stories is one way and using the objects is another. Um, but if, I mean, I, I could have done 75 objects. There were so many and it was, it was hard to not, not use all of them. But, Maybe that'll be another another book or a website. Who knows? Okay. Um, great. Thank you. Uh, were any male labor groups pro woman suffrage? Were there any particular any specific groups? I think you might have stumped the speaker on that one. Um, there were men's groups that supported suffrage, the Men's Alliance for Women's Suffrage. But I think that the membership was predominantly elite white men, Columbia professors, you know, John Dewey, that, that kind of, um, that kind of leader, not, uh, Al Gompers or David Davinsky from the, um, Garment Workers Union. And in general, um, you know, the labor move, the male led labor movement was not as, um, attuned to the possibilities for uh, organizing women workers. Uh, they often didn't get it. The women who were organizing knew how to do it, uh, but very often the male leaders were indifferent um, or not interested. Uh, so I think that it would not be accurate to count the male leadership of the traditional unions as being strongly in the suffrage camp I certainly hope by 1915 or 1917 they had they had come around. Um, but again, this is an initiative that is really coming from the women in the labor movement rather than the men encouraging the women. Hmm. Um, where did Schneiderman uh, live on the Lower East Side? Uh, and is the building that she lived in there? And then on a related question, uh, did she return to New York City later in her life? Well, of course she's a New Yorker. <laughs> and I mean, I, I think she's, New York is in her, she's a New Yorker, always. Um, but Phyllis, you'll have to say whether that building is still standing. You gave the address. I, I believe it's there, but I'd have to check. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, how did she earn money while she did her uh, suffragette work? 
Well, that's a very important question. The question of who can be involved in a movement. If you are an upper middle class married woman and your husband supports what you're doing, he's basically subsidizing your career as the suffragist. If you are working in a uh, garment factory or as a cap maker or something like that, um, you can't volunteer your time. You need to be earning a living. And so what one of the things that working class labor activists forced the suffrage leadership to acknowledge, and this was also true of uh, other um, white professional women who weren't working in factories, but who just didn't have the means to volunteer, was that they needed to be paid salaries. Um, they needed to be put on the payroll so that they could organize uh, for suffrage and that it wasn't something that they could just volunteer to do after spending 10 to 12 hours, you know, in a laundry uh, to expect them to go out and canvas on the Lower East Side. And they were quite forceful as saying, you want our voices, you want our activism, you have to help, you have to pay us. Uh, and so there were salaries. There also are cases sometimes where, uh, especially very promising um, activists and leaders, well, like Leonora O'Reilly, was given an, a life annuity by one of her elite uh, supporters. And that was a substitute for having to earn her way um, to having a, a job. And then she was able to, to use her activism. But Again, this is a way that um, the working class perspective really is a, a kind of wake up call probably to many of these more elite suffragists who sort of had to be reminded that, oh, not everybody has a comfortable existence and can volunteer their time. Um, can you talk about and maybe explain the women who were uh, vehemently anti-suffrage? It's always a challenge because it, you just say, you know, there were women opposed to it and people say, huh, how could that be? But there was actually a fairly organized, quite well organized anti-suffrage movement led almost up until the very end by women. And they had a coherent philosophy that was not saying that women had to stay only at home. They were obviously, if they're organizing a movement, they're out in public too. But what they're concerned about is they want to keep women above and out of politics and party machines, which is how pol political parties functioned at the time. And this was seen as not something that was really suitable for women and, and not desirable. And they also, I think, had a philosophy that women could be more influential if they didn't take, if they weren't partisan, if they didn't sign their allegiance to the Democratic Party or the Republican Party, that they could stand above politics and say, but this is an issue and we think this is the right stand on this issue, no matter whether the party has taken the stand one way or the other. And, you know, in a lot of ways, their stance is not all that different from the one that the League of Women Voters adopted uh, when it was founded in, 19, in 1920. Um, but, and it also, they were, one reason they were so effective was politicians loved them. You know, if you have a group of well-heeled women come in and say, oh, we don't want the vote, then when the suffragists come in to lobby, uh, the politician can say, but I just had a delegation in here of women who said they don't need or want the vote. Why should I listen to you? Um, we have two kind of related uh, questions in a way. Um, one is uh, about um, how important were newspapers and wire services to the movement and did New York City play a media capital outside, outsized role? And then um, a related uh, question on uh, the Lower East Side and uh, it's today with the pandemic and the Black Lives Matter movement against police brutality, it's easy to see how organizing and public protest overlap with street life. 
you think the density and street life of the Lower East Side contributed to the organizing savvy of the women's trade unionists? Well, to answer that second question, yes. Um, and one of the things that um, an activist like Rose Schneiderman brought to the suffrage movement was she was used to just getting up on a soapbox and making a speech outside of a factory when the shift changes. Um, she was an accomplished public speaker. She knew how to deal with hecklers. And there was a kind of public confidence from being in the streets, to being out on the streets, not being intimidated by all that was going on, that made them pretty um, indomitable. <laughs> you know, they, they, they would not back down. And for many middle-class women, more elite women, they were terrified the first time they had to give a speech or stand on a street corner and try and sell, sell a newspaper. Um, this is something that was not in the bounds of, of respectability. And so I think that there is definitely a correlation. And it's another example of how the suffrage movement learns from and adapts uh, the techniques from the labor movement and just from the kind of street savvy organizing that goes on in densely populated neighborhoods like the Lower East Side at the time. Um, in terms of media, um, New York City was obviously a media capital. Um, I always think it's somewhat funny. I've been involved with various things that the New York Times is doing as, as we approach the suffrage centennial. And I, you know, any of us historians have to sort of say at some point, <laughs> you do realize that the New York Times was uh, quite opposed to women's suffrage and wrote editorials and slanted its coverage uh, against it. And then they sheepishly say, yes, we do know that. Um, we're trying to change. Um, but I do think that what the suffragists needed to do, especially towards the end, um, was marshal as much of the media at the time, which is a combination of national um, magazines and then local newspapers, newsreels, uh, all kinds of things to try and get their arguments across. And also what they were trying to do was just to make suffrage something that you can't ignore anymore. Um, and I think that's really the key to the last decade of the movement as, the, as they move into the streets and start having um, parades and picketing and things like that. They make suffrage something that you it's really in your face. You can't, you can't ignore it. Whereas in the 19th century, there are lots of meetings held in churches and in parlors and people are talking to each other, but it was pretty easy to ignore. Uh, and so I think that there are a lot of ways that suffragists just used whatever media they had at their disposal uh, and tried to use it to get their, to get their message across. I can't hear you. Richard, you there? Sorry. <laughs> um, You're bad. <laughs> yeah, no, that, was, uh, that was me forgetting to unmute myself. Um, you describe vastly different women who were suffragists. Uh, you profile uh, African-American club woman and internationalist Mary Church Terrell, trade union leader Rose Schneiderman, uh, a Mormon sister wife, a Washington State Mountaineer, among others. Did these women operate in pockets? Were they bridge builders? Were, were bridge builders valued? I know you touched a little bit on your talk, um, but we also had someone uh, ask about uh, speaking, if you could speak uh, more on racism in the movement. Yeah, well, let's circle back to that. Um, I see these women, I mean, the idea of stepping back from, or stepping down from the national leadership you know, the, the presidents of the national organizations is that it gives you a sense of how social movements happen. And they don't just happen in national headquarters, they happen on the local and state levels. And so one of the things I was trying to do was to show the breadth of activism 
in places across the country, you know, the Lower East Side of New York, but also, you know, mountain climbing in, in Washington State. And I don't think many of these women knew each other personally. They maybe read about the exploits, um, but they are very much, I mean, the way I think of them is just these individuals who are part of this larger movement. Um, and that, that in that sense, they are showing a range of contributions that women, that women can make. Um, the question of racism is racism in the suffrage movement is one that, you know, for a lot of people, it's kind of a deal breaker. They say the movement was white and racist and therefore we can dismiss it. And I think that's a very short-sighted view because when you dismiss the whole women's suffrage movement entirely, you basically erase the contributions of African-American suffragists. And this does not seem to me a good outcome. Um, and the more we learn, we see how vibrant the African-American women's suffrage community was. It was very often operating on a parallel track to the white movement. There are some moments of intersection, uh, but because of the prevailing racism at the time, not as many as um, there probably should have been. And yet what's so important about including that perspective is that African-American women, like working class women, had a much broader view of women's rights than just being about gender because they knew that voting was not just, they weren't just trying to get votes for women, they were very much trying to reclaim votes for African-American men who had lost the vote, who had gained the vote after the Civil War and then had it taken away uh, by Jim Crow restrictions. And so their activism was part of a much larger vision of social change for the entire community that included men and women. And to me, that is the predominant reason why we just need to talk and talk again about the, what African-American women did in the movement. And I've been very gratified to see how much discussion there has been of that issue, uh, but in a productive way, as I've been giving talks and reading what people are writing. I think people really are grappling with it um, in ways that are constructive, even though it is um, not the story we would like to tell. Um, so, um, great, thanks. Uh, it seems the moderate suffragists and, and the militants ultimately hated each other <laughs> and that maybe their antagonism did the movement good, creating a, a kind of good cop, bad cop dynamic that made the moderate suffragists seem more tolerable. Can factions and splits be a good thing? Can we distinguish good factions from bad factions? One thinks of, uh, for example, of recent Women's March factions. Yeah, oh, factions. Well, if you're gonna have a feminist movement, you're gonna have factions <laughs> and you're gonna have disagreements over tactics and priorities. And as a historian, as I've studied the movement, uh, I really, there were two moments when the suffrage movement split in two. One was immediately after the Civil War over the divisive question of enfranchising African-American men, but not prioritizing votes for women. And then the second is in the very end stages of the movement with Alice Paul and her militant National Women's Party picketing the White House, even in wartime, and Carrie Chapman Katz more mainstream organization doing the kind of traditional work within the system, lobbying and, and you know, gathering support and all those things. And especially in the second case the, at the end, I think both were absolutely necessary. Having said that, they, the two sides really did. Um, I mean, there were some deep personal animosities that do not ever heal. I mean, they are still going strong 30 or 40 years later. People took this so seriously. Um, and yet we know that women as a group 
never will come together as a block. They're just too diverse. I mean, obviously that women who are anti-suffragists should show us that. And then to have splits within the women's movement. And so I think that the, the moral for us now is just to uh, embrace those and try to work constructively and creatively and to know that we are facing an uphill battle and we need all the support and strength and activism and energy that we, that we can garner. And it's gonna come from different groups in different ways, um, but usually it's all heading in the same general direction. And I think one of the things that is really, I've, is the feeling that I have gotten out of being so involved in the suffrage centennial and talking about my book to audience and is that I just really feel like the suffrage story is part of something much bigger. And that I, as a contemporary feminist and a voter in 2020, that when I vote, I am part of this larger movement of women's political mobilization that is ongoing and will always be necessary. And to me, that's a, a very powerful feeling of connecting my own life and my politics and priorities with what has come before. Um, and I really hope that you know, when people do go to the polls, if they do, if they're not voting by <laughs> absentee, uh, that they really have a sense of women fighting and some being prepared to give up their lives for women to have the vote and that it really behooves us not just to vote but to be active engaged citizens because there sure is a lot out there calling for our attention um you write about race and the struggle within the suffrage movement to include black women this seems similar to the lgbtq movement and the controversy over transgender rights so many mainstream gay rights organizations were willing to exclude transgender rights in order to get anti-discrimination laws to cover lesbians and gays. This seemed perhaps rational at the time, but now seems wrong and vicious. Can suffrage uh, history help us think through when compromise is strategic and when it's just plain and moral? I think that in some ways, there are some general parallels there. But I think that the more to the point is just to remember that all of these initiatives are happening in a vastly changing political landscape where things really underneath us are changing from year to year. Um, and certainly on the topic of um, LGBTQ rights, there have been dramatic changes just over the last couple of years. And I think it behooves us to always be seeing where we are now and making and be listening to each other and all points of view and to be able to understand where people were before when they made choices that seem strange or wrong or perhaps immoral but again to put it in this larger picture and to realize that three or four years from now, we're gonna be talking, we may be talking about things that aren't even on the agenda now. And I think that's humbling. I think it also shows what hard work, um, coalition building and seeking political change is. Um, but just because it's hard work doesn't mean we shouldn't keep doing it. So I, I think we can do one more, one more question, which again is kind of a broad question and how you know, the suffrage movement uh, relates to today is are there any other uh, lessons for today uh, beyond perseverance we can learn from the uh, from the suffrage movement and what can it tell us about strategy I, I know that you talked about building you know coalitions and, and but you know any any other any other thoughts on that I think the the takeaway point that um, that is really important for people to remember is how hard fought the battle was for suffrage. And yet the right voting rights are fragile. They are under attack. Uh, we see evidence of uh, concentrated efforts at voter suppression. 
and we cannot get complacent. Uh, and I think that calling out these attempts when they happen is very important, trying to then amass enough people to overcome them but just to remember that again, this is a, this, this, there's no end point to this, to this struggle and voting rights uh, are still a work in progress and much has changed and many more people are voting. And yet, as we're learning, many people are at risk of their votes not counting. And we have a major election coming up and we need to make sure that those who vote, that their votes are counted. Um, and I think we would do that anyway, um, but I think we should do it to honor the suffragists <laughs> on the 100th anniversary of, their, uh, of the passage of the 19th Amendment. Oh, thank you, thank you. And uh, let me just share everybody the results of our poll. Um, we uh, ha have uh, people from a pretty diverse, uh, group of locations around the country. About half are from New York City outside the Lower East Side. About 20% um, of about 65 people are from the Lower East Side. Uh, Tri-state area, about 15%. And the US outside the tri-state area is uh, 15%, which is one of the nice things about Zoom, uh, moving from a uh, you know, in-person, real-life format uh, where people almost always live right nearby, uh, we do get people from all around, uh, which, which, which is nice. And uh, well, uh, Susan, I wanna thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. You know, it was, it was really, really great. Thank you so much. And uh, I wanna thank uh, our audience as well uh, for your excellent questions, uh, as, as, as well as for joining us this evening. And uh, for those of you who missed some or all of tonight's presentation, uh, within the next few days, uh, we should have it up on our YouTube channel, uh, along with other past uh, webinars that we've sponsored. And uh, you can access our YouTube channel through our website, uh, www.lesby-nyc.org, which you could see right below, I mean, right above the bottom of your uh, screen now. Um, also, uh, please keep your eyes open uh, for our invitation to our September 8th Lesby General Meeting uh, where we'll have a presentation on Great Lower East Side buildings that we'll be proposing to the New York City Landmarks Preservation Commission for landmarking. And finally, uh, although uh, these are very difficult times, uh, please consider making a donation uh, to LESPI today, uh, if you can. Um, we need donations to help us continue uh, to uh, sponsor webinars such as this one and to continue our advocacy work uh, for uh, Lower East Side preservation and landmarking. Uh, you can find a donate button on your original invitation to this event, which uh, would have come from Lesby itself, and also at uh, our website, uh, lesby-nyc.org on the home page. And uh, thank you again, everyone, for attending, and uh, please have a good night and stay safe. <laughs>